all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today's show is going to be a day of geometric deep learning. So our opener, Tawaki Takikawa, is going to talk about his latest uh, CDPR oral paper called Neural Geometric Levels of Details, uh, Real-Time Rendering with Implicit 3D Shapes. And our headliner, Professor Siddhartha Choudhury, uh, to talk about uh, assembly-based modeling, past, present, and future. And as usual, if you have any questions, please leave comments in the YouTube chat or our Discord channel. So first, it is my great pleasure to introduce our opener, Tawaki Takikawa. He's a first year PhD student at University of Toronto, supervised by Professor Sonia Fiddler and Professor Alec Jacobson. And he's also a research scientist at NVIDIA, mentored by Dr. Mongo McGuire. And as one of Tawaki's lab mates, um, he, he's like a walking dictionary to me. Like every, like every few days, he will basically uh, post um, like the, perhaps the latest neural implicit work on like posted on archive to give everyone up to date on the latest research. And this also led him to this great paper he's going to talk about today called the Neural Levels of Details. And personally, I'm a big fan of, of this paper. This neural LLD can use less memory and learns a neural implicit that captures much finer geometric details. And it can be rendered 100 times faster uh, than previous approaches. So without further delay, let's go on Tawaki to tell us more about his uh, great neural LLD. Thanks, Derek, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. All right, hopefully my screen share is working. So today I'll be presenting neural geometric level of detail, real-time rendering with implicit 3D shapes. This is work done at NVIDIA, University of Toronto, McGill University, and it's collaboration, collaborative work with Joey, Kang Shui, Karsten, Charles, Derek, uh, Alec Jacobson, Morgan, uh, and Sanya. And this paper was recently accepted at CVPR 2021 as an oral presentation. So in today's world, 3D scanning is increasingly becoming a commodity. iPhones come shipped with LiDAR sensors that give you depth information, and many research groups are developing mobile light stages, which lets you capture high fidelity geometry and materials using a lightweight setup. Companies like Canon and Sony are developing uh, image sensors that have depth sensing capabilities that are increasingly integrated into conventional imaging systems. In conjunction with this, entirely new modeling pipelines like you see in like sculpting for like Dreams PS4 using sine distance function and like for VR modeling tools like Adobe Medium, alongside a lot of uh, innovations and in generative modeling technologies, which I believe Siddhartha will talk about uh, after this talk, uh, what this basically leads to is that artists are able to create high fidelity assets easier than ever before. What this means is that scene complexity is exploding. So in the future, we might have these, you know, million triangle meshes and stuff like that. And for a scene like Pixar's like, you know, Coco movie or something crazy like that, you might have hundreds of these, you know, super high fidelity meshes, which you end up with gigabytes and gigabytes of data that you have to somehow manage and stream and uh, communicate to different clients and stuff like that. This is a huge problem for like distributed graphics workloads in the future you might have, where you might have like a data center of GPUs and you might not want to just render on one GPU, but you want to render over a thousand GPUs. In these scenarios, the bottleneck is no longer really even the rendering algorithm anymore. It's actually the streaming and communication and synchronization of these huge mega assets between these different GPUs. And stuff like this might have applications in stuff like digital twins, cloud gaming, scientific visualization, physics simulation, and more. This is also a huge problem for like edge graphics workloads where you might have like a game like Roblox where you log into some kind of game and you get, uh, you have to like uh, stream the assets for like the, ga your, the game that you're playing on demand onto your mobile device, which might not be even connected to Wi-Fi. It might be over like some, you know, limited bandwidth uh, mobile connection or something like that. This might also be a problem for like field robotics and like autonomous driving and stuff like that, where you have these robots out in the wild uh, you know, like uh, trying to reason about the 3D environment that it's in. And you might want to stream some geometric information to these field robots. In these scenarios, you have very limited storage on the devices, 
but you have even more limited bandwidth. And having these, you know, super big gigabyte meshes can be a huge problem in these scenarios. This type of like, memory, memory and bandwidth constraints have been well studied in the form of level of detail in traditional computer graphics. Level of detail is a technique where you can take a high fidelity mesh and you can decimate the geometry of that mesh down to some uh, predefined uh, triangle count or vertex count or something like that. These techniques were super important back in the days of like you know old video games like Mario 64 on the Nintendo 64, where you're working with 64 megabytes of storage and four megabytes of RAM. So this type of like you know st space savings are super important. A lot of these like uh, LOD techniques were developed in the 90s when these video games were around. And this is an example of a decimated Mario on the left. The problem with a lot of these traditional techniques is that they have to create discrete uh, level of detail meshes. And basically, this discrete transition causes a lot of temporal jitter. Another thing is that you also get huge quality reductions, especially at low poly counts. So oftentimes, when you generate these LODs, an artist have to actually manually edit these LODs mm -hmm. so that they look nicer. And this is a huge. Uh, constraint and also a huge like uh, workload uh, difficulty for artists today even. This type of like uh, flickering between different discrete LODs can be still seen in uh, modern video games. This is a game that I really like from the recent history, Death Stranding, which came out in 2019. You can kind of see as you zoom in and out on this like a uh, rock, you can actually see the death flickering that happens from those transitions between the discrete LODs. So what we essentially need is the geometry representation with compact storage footprint without sacrificing quality. You want to also have multiple continuous levels of detail. You want it to be computationally efficient, both so that you can directly render your representation, but also if you want to convert your representation to like a mesh or something, you still need it to be computationally efficient. And if you also, as an added bonus, have differentiability, you can take advantage of a lot of the cool deep learning stuff that's happening in the world right now. So the representation we look at is sign distance functions. In the 2D case, a sign distance function is a function of x and y, where the x and y are positioned on a 2D grid. And it gives you d, which is the distance to the nearest curve. And in the 2D case, all points at which this uh, sign distance function equals 0 defines the ISO curve for this function, which you can see on the right side. In the 3D case, it's a little bit more hard, hard to, harder to visualize, but it's a function of x, y, and z, so basically a 3D position. And then you get d, which is the nearest distance to the surface. And basically, in this case, all points at which d equals 0 defines the implicit surface. So for this teapot on the right, the black ISO contour basically shows the ISO surface, and the white ISO contours on the plane shows the different uh, ISO, con ISO surfaces at different values of d. The nice thing about sign distance functions are that they are very compact. So if you have a very simple shape like a, uh, like a sphere, for example, if you want to represent this as a mesh, you need to have a bunch of vertices and a lot of triangles to represent this kind of object. In the case of a sign distance function, it's actually a very simple math function that you can use that you probably learned in high school, uh, high school geometry or trigonometry or something like that. And this is very compact in comparison to like a mesh. The bad news is that most 3D data don't come as these math functions. You actually have a mesh for most 3D data that's available in the world right now. So it's unclear what the function should be in this case. Fortunately, uh, there are algorithms that exist where you can take a mesh, and for a given point, you can calculate what the sign distance function is by, is by running some specialized algorithm for that. So basically, we have the inputs and outputs, but not the function that actually encodes those inputs and outputs. So when you have an unknown function with input and output, the modern trend in the current world is that you can neuralify it and use machine learning to learn that function. And this is exactly what they do in a lot of these previous papers, such as deep SDF and occupancy networks, where you have you know, a bunch of samples of like uh, x, y, z points and their corresponding sign distance functions. And then you take a parameterized fixed size multi-layer perceptron and fit that function and approximate that function. Now, the nice thing about this is that you have fixed computational cost to fit anything you want. The problem, however, with these previous works is that they often use a very large MLP with millions of parameters to fit these functions. And this is a huge problem if you think about how these sign distance functions are rendered, because they rely on an algorithm called sphere tracing, which basically, for a given ray, optimally finds the ray surface intersection by repeatedly querying along that ray. So if you think about the computational budget required to render a single image with these neural sign distance functions, 
you basically need uh, to do, run the sign distance function query times the number of pixels times the number of sphere tracing steps you have, which can be in the hundreds, uh, which quickly becomes infeasible to render uh, any reasonable rate. Another problem with these previous works is that they are also not adaptive. So whether you have a simple shape or a complex shape, you have to use the same fixed computational budget MLP to fit it. But the other problem also is that uh, you don't have any notion of LOD. So whether you're far away from the object or close to the object, you're always rendering the same object with the uh, fixed computational workloads. So these are exactly the problems that we intend to uh, solve in our neural geometric level of detail paper. And the idea of this work is that instead of like having a global feature vector, you have an octree, a sparse octree volume on feature vectors. This uh, sparse octree volume lets you uh, query these features really fast with uh, specialized algorithms. And the nice thing about this is that the levels of this octree also corresponds to the level of detail of your object. And then you can avoid the boundary artifacts that you get, might get from like a grid-based representation by interpolating on those feature vectors. And you can additionally get uh, continuous LOD by inter interpolating across the different LODs. And key to the, our performance in terms of rendering time is a small, super small neural network that we can employ to uh, fit this. And the reason why we can use a small uh, neural network here is because each of these octree volumes, as you get finer and finer and finer, encode actually simpler surfaces. And you can actually get away with using a very simple surface extractor mechanism. We also design a very specific rendering algorithm and alongside a uh, sparse voxel austri traversal algorithm, which I won't go into detail now, but if you can refer to the paper for more details. So here are some results on like a uh, uh, ground truth mesh. On the very right is the reference mesh. And from left to right is neural implicits for feature networks and Rs. And you can really see here that only R network is able to uh, resolve the fine details of the reference mesh. Here's another example with more movement. You can see in blue, our representation, and in orange, baselines like deep SDF and Fourier feature network and others. You can only see that only our network is able to uh, capture the fine details of this chameleon and the clock. Here are some uh, more quantitative results. Basically, the idea here is that even though we use less parameters than a lot of the previous works, we're able to fit it much better. And we show a much better bitrate distortion curve than the other previous works. We also check the performance on very special SDFs. These are assigned distance functions. So these are like math functions that people have built up for a specific geometry. And then we basically fit these uh, assigned distance functions that have uh, interesting math properties like these discontinuities and seams or like recursive fractal SDFs, which are defined recursively and have a lot of detail. In these scenarios, we also find that ours is able to fit it reasonably well, whereas the previous works are not able to fit these super complex sign distance functions very well. We also show a comparison between the more traditional mesh simplification workflows, like tr traditional level of detail. And we basically compare these representations at equal bit rates, so equal storage and memory uh, impact. And basically, we see that our representation is able to capture the uh, details better than uh, something like edge collapse can. And we also show rendering performance. So we are able to render in real time our representation without sacrificing details. And we were able to get over 100x speed up uh, with respect to previous works. We do have some key limitations that I just want to uh, outline. One of them is that it's not really clear with this uh, pipeline how you handle deformations and animation. However, there are some uh, promising previous works that do handle like animations for uh, sign distance functions. So I think that it would be really interesting to see how these like uh, works are uh, applicable to our work. Another question is how you handle thin and volumetric geometry. The thing with sign distance functions is that they don't handle uh, volumes and like a thin geometry very well. So I think it's very interesting to uh, see how we can handle this type of uh, geometry in the future. I also want to acknowledge my amazing co-authors that uh, I wouldn't have been able to do this work without. And this, is, this work came from a lot of helpful feedback and discussions with a lot of uh, superb collaborators. And also I want to credit the artists that we use their meshes and also sign distance functions for in a lot of the examples in the paper. Yeah, thanks. I guess a question I get a lot is that when is the code release coming? And I just want to say here that the code release is coming very soon. We're working hard uh, to release it. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of these contact informations I have here. Thank you.
Thank you, Tawaki, for the fantastic talk. So as usual, we will proceed to the talk about Headliner and have a joint Q&A at the end. So now it's my great, great honor to introduce uh, our Headliner, Professor Sitata Choudhury. He's the assistant professor at IIT Bombay and also senior research scientist at Adobe and where he developed a 3D character modeling tool called uh, Adobe Fuse. And he's one of the pioneers in geometric deep learning, even before the existence of large 3D data sets such as a shape net, or even this term geometric deep learning, he already started to work on how to utilize shape data to do 3D modeling. And this includes a lot of his early works uh, on using probabilistic models to synthesize novel 3D shapes. And now he's a leading researcher in this field. Every year in SEGGRAPH, CBPR, or other conferences, his research on assembly-based modeling continue to surprise me with higher and higher quality of machine-generated machine 3D shapes. And today we are so lucky to have Professor Choudhury to share his story from his early research as a pioneer to the latest research as a leading researcher and also his vision towards the future. So without further delay, uh, please join me to welcome Professor Choudhury. I think you're muted, uh, Sid. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome, and can you see my screen? Yes. All right, great, let's start. Uh, so thank you very much, Derek, for this uh, incredibly flattering introduction, which I am 100% sure I don't, I, I don't deserve in, in, in those terms, but you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll take it. Um, uh, I, I don't think I'm, uh, you know, I, I deserve that much credit for being a pioneer. I mean, normally we write papers in which we say such and such works, are pioneering in our field and we just write piggyback on their backs. So, so I'm going to talk about a lot of work that uh, I was lucky enough to be able to work on and collaborate on that piggybacks on the work of you know, people I consider actual uh, earlier pioneers. But um, uh, I, I, I am you know, enjoying following uh, on from uh, Tawaki's talk because um, he presented a a deep dive into very compelling cutting edge work. And I'm going to be uh, providing some contrast by doing uh, exactly the opposite. I'm going to provide a very broad based retrospective of let's say about a decade uh, or depending on how you count a couple of decades of work. And uh, this will address a topic that's very close to my heart. Uh, it's, it's called assembly-based modeling. I'll talk about what that is. Uh, I've added this sort of pompous trap line, past, present, and future. Uh, this will necessarily be a somewhat egocentric past, present, and future. It's impossible in 40 minutes to cover uh, the full range of works that have been uh, developed on this topic. But uh, I, I think a lot of the main threads uh, have been tracked on by some of these projects that I've been lucky enough to work on. And I'm going to, um, talk about many of these projects. I'm going to talk about assembly-based modeling filtered through uh, this line of work. And uh, I'm necessarily going to omit many works by other authors, which are also relevant. And I beg their collective forgiveness. Um, and and you know, that's probably the stuff of a larger survey article later on. OK, so let's jump right into it. Uh, by assembly-based modeling, I mean constructing virtual three-dimensional shapes from pre-existing components, right? So, so that's what you would imagine is uh, the meaning of a phrase like assembly-based modeling, modeling by assembling components. And uh, in this teaser image, all these ships are constructed by mixing and matching parts from a large collection of segmented ships that we had available to us beforehand. And um, when you hear the term assembly-based modeling, we typically tend to think of it in the context of industrial design, right? You have these uh, ginormously complicated CAD programs and within them you construct these components or you have uh, access to a repository of components. And then you have various ways to put together these components with constraints. You have uh, all sorts of simulation that you can run on them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, so this is hardcore purposeful industrial design and assembly-based modeling in this fashion is a cornerstone of this, um, of this entire field. But I want to come at assembly-based modeling from a completely different, uh, let's say, philosophical source as well. And um, 
I'll, I'll slowly segue into it, uh, beginning with some more consumer facing examples, right? So, so on the left, you see um, uh, what's, what's called kit bashing. You take little construction kits, you break them up into pieces, and then you put them together to make something new, right? So, so all sorts of extremely ingenious uh, assemblies have been constructed in this fashion. This is one example that I found uh, online. And, and of course, we're all familiar with Lego. And again, this is sort of consumer facing way for people to generate their own creative uh, assemblies of these little bricks. Right? So, so uh, there, there's this element of modularity and reusing parts that uh, comes into this over and over again. But there's also this element of artistic creativity that uh, is, is evident in many of these works. And so we're sort of moving from this very purpose-built notion uh, of industrial design to something a little more playful, a little more creative, and, and that brings us to a sort of completely art historical context, right? So, so uh, I, I put up these two collages from, uh, from, from Dadaist uh, artists, Hannah Hock and Kurt Schwitters. And uh, one is uh, a completely 2D collage. It's, it's flat and two-dimensional. And the other one is sort of two and a half dimensional. And there are three-dimensional objects placed on this board. And, and the Dadaists, of course, you know, wanted to reject uh, the ideology of bourgeois capitalism. They uh, wanted to reject these, these sort of principles of rationalist logic or purpose. And, and they were more interested in exploring the unconscious or chance or uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, the, the, the surreal, surrealist ideas of, of creativity. And um, there are many things to learn from if you look at the work of the Dadaists and the way they exploit collage and photo montage as, as critical aspects of their work. But um, I, I want to look at these specifically as examples of assemblies and, and not just in this uh, more art historical philosophical re realm. So if you look at, for example, how Hannah Hock's uh, collage on the left is put together, you see that there is um, a deep sense of creativity and form in how these different elements have been combined. I mean, there's the uh, apes, uh, half the apes face and a human face put together in ways that it merges together in this artistic whole. And the, 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 the sort of surrealist dreamlike uh, assemblage of the wings on the head and so on and so forth, right? And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, this, this move away from representational uh, street art or whatever you want to call it um, was was viewed by uh, their contemporaries and and for many of these uh, Dadaists, the contemporaries were the Third Reich and the Nazis as pathologically degenerate so uh, you know it's uh, this is a pretty strong point in favor of your art if the Nazis think that you're pathologically degenerate and uh, uh, you know you heard it here uh, visual assembly fights fascism so you know, that's that's sort of uh, nice, but um, the Dadaists took this one step further. Uh, it, it wasn't just one artist assembling artworks by combining found elements. They did this as collaborations. So uh, they, they coined this term called exquisite corpse or, um, uh, or, or artworks created by multiple artists adding little pieces of each artwork, often without looking at what the previous person was doing. So you know, the, the, the strict idea of an exquisite corpse is that you fold the paper so that the next person can't see what you did. Uh, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case in all of these artworks here. Some are collaborative drawings, some are collaborative collages, but there is this sense of assembling things from found elements, from uh, self-generated drawings, um, and, and thereby this, this artwork uh, acquires a certain new dimension. Of course, the, the Dadaists took this one step further. So uh, the Dadaist manifesto uh, says that a Dadaist poem is when you take a newspaper, chop an article up into um, its constituent words, and then you shuffle the words, pull out the words one at a time, and then lay them out in this random order. And this is a poem that subconsciously supposedly resembles, right? So, so this, this complete element of randomness is perhaps not quite what we are getting at, but there is this um, deep art historical perspective to visual assembly that goes side by side with the developing ideas of computational and algorithmic and mathematical approaches to industrial design and extremely purpose-built um, uh, assemblies for 
solving functional goals. Okay, so um, you know, I came across the idea of assembling things at, at, at a very, very young age when I saw this uh, book, which uh, is, is a flip book. And uh, this is the cover of the book. It's called Croc Gufant. It comes in many different forms. And the idea is that each page is divided into uh, a top, a middle, and a bottom. And you can flip those so that the animals on the different pages get their tops, middles, and bottoms interchanged to create these interesting creatures. And, and it's you know, carefully done so that the profiles match up at the interfaces between these uh, little flipboards. And, and so the final structure actually looks quite interesting. And, and there are a lot of you know, uh, things, uh, there are a lot of features in this process that will repeat over and over again in the rest of my talk. Okay, so um, I, I really like this idea that you can create your own flipbook. Uh, this is a hand-drawn flipbook with words in addition, or, or with, with little bits of sentences in addition to the drawings. And there are three-dimensional versions. You can you can have a version of Krogufant made out of wooden blocks. Uh, and of course, eventually there will be a SIGGRAPH paper written about uh, uh, every one of these, you know, you know, deep and interesting and and profound little toys. So uh, there's this uh, very nice SIGGRAPH paper written about creating uh, uh, little blocks, which are pieces of uh, animals or other shapes, which you can put together to create new um, new creatures uh, by mixing and matching. And uh, the a lot of the interesting algorithmic work goes into making sure that uh, the pieces line up when you fit them together, even if they come from completely different sources. Okay, so. Um, Having laid this perspective from uh, first industrial design, then art history, and finally this element of play and mixing and matching and prototyping and exploration, uh, I, I want to show you one of the interfaces that we developed for doing assembly-based 3D modeling on a computer. And uh, I, I want to tie all these different streams together to come up with some sort of manifesto for assembly-based modeling for which this interface will be a uh, uh, sort of crucible. And the task we are going to try to uh, address with this interface is to build a cute toy for a small child. And uh, in this interface, you see a modeling area on the left and an access to a library of parts on the right, which are labeled as torso, head, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are all parts of a database of animals that was pre-segmented and pre-processed in advance and is available to the backend. So let's see what happens when we interact with this interface. Okay. So remember, we are trying to get a cute over a small child, but once I have this uh, for initial assembly, I can change the parts by changing their attributes. So I can make a part more or less scary. So I'm exploring the space of assemblies by changing attributes of individual parts. This is a slightly different uh, uh, widget to do essentially the same thing. Now I'm doing the less dangerous uh, animal uh, bodies. Uh, I want stubbier legs because you know I associate cuteness with stubbiness. So I'm uh, going to make the uh, the legs le more stubby or less agile. I want a shorter um, uh, tail. And um, then I decide that I need some wings. Those wings look too scary to be cute. So I'll try to make them a little more graceful. Um, I'll make them a little smaller, flap, flap, flap. And there we go. Okay, so in uh, about 30 seconds, and this video isn't really speed sped up significantly, we put together a creature which I at least thought was cute when I created it. Some of you might, some of you might not. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that most combinations of animal parts look pretty monstrous, right? And to find something that satisfies a goal like a cute toy is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So this interface, in addition to providing with these pre-assembled uh, in quotes, monstrous shapes allows you to way to navigate the space using these linguistic attributes that you saw on the bottom. Okay, all right. So, given what we just saw, I want to lay out what I think of when I hear the phrase assembly based 3D modeling. I, I think of it as fulfilling a design goal by retrieving and assembling modular, pre existing, high ish level components. And I, why do I specifically mention high-ish level? Uh, that's because um, 
I think of putting together a house, for example, from these large structural and semantic components like roofs and windows and walls and rooms and fireplaces and basements is assembly-based modeling, putting together chair from parts that you can ascribe uh, semantic or functional names to is assembly-based modeling, but uh, constructing a wall from bricks is not really, at least in terms of this manifesto, right? The bricks are too atomic. The bricks are too indistinguishable from each other. They don't really have individual purpose other than just supporting some larger functional structure. And so by the same metric, Minecraft is not assembly-based modeling, fascinating though it is. Uh, matchstick architecture is not assembly-based modeling, skillful though it is. Uh, okay, now I highlighted some of the words in that previous sentence in uh, non-black colors, and those correspond to what I see as key challenges in assembly-based 3D modeling. And these are threefold, and the rest of my talk is going to be structured around these key challenges. Uh, the first is retrieval from a part database, retrieval of parts, as per you know, whatever uh, requirements we have assembly of those parts into a coherent structure. So as you imagine that you've you know, bought a kit from Ikea and now you have to take the parts in that kit and put it together to make your cabinet a chair or whatever it is. So, so you know, that's the assembly problem. And finally, there's the design problem, which is the overall feasibility. And feasibility is a vague word which you can interpret in whatever way you want, you know, function, aesthetics, uh, some other notion of uh, human intent. So you, you want your uh, assembly to fulfill uh, these goals to have a certain overall real world feasibility. And, and that's the third axis of this uh, trio of challenges. And, and I want to emphasize that these uh, three different things are not independent. They're all components in a joint problem. And I mean this in a strictly operational sense, which means that if you want to solve any one of these problems really well, you probably have to solve at least partially the other two problems as well. Right? You, you can't do retrieval without having some notion of what you're going to assemble and what your overall design goal is, and similarly for the other two cases. Okay, so the rest of my talk will follow the outline of looking at these three challenges uh, in the light of work mostly from the last decade and uh, a, a little bit before that. Uh, much of it is going to be work that I was privileged enough to collaborate on, but uh, there's going to be some work from other people as well. And, and as I said, there's a lot more out there which we can talk about uh, offline and or, or if you look around in the literature. Okay. So first, let's start with the retrieval challenge. And I like to think of uh, the problem of retrieval in assembly-based modeling as being of two fundamental types. One in which you look for a part with some explicit user input. So, so you say, I want my part to sort of be here and look sort of like this. And the system goes and retrieves parts from uh, the database that is available to you and does something with it. Okay, so, so that's, that's the retrieval with explicit user input. There is also uh, the possibility of a retrieval with only the partial shape that you're constructing as the query. So in other words, the system needs to be smart enough to look at what you're building, figure out what you're trying to do, and then retrieve components that it thinks can suitably augment that. Right? And we're going to look at examples of both of these different approaches uh, in the context of, of uh, some, some work. Okay, so here's a work that I truly consider pioneering in the context of uh, assembly-based modeling uh, on a computer. And uh, this is a paper called uh, Modeling by Example. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's cited uh, by pretty much every assembly-based modeling that has been published since 2004. Um, and the uh, basic idea is that it, it proposed this notion that you could construct new 3D shapes by searching for existing 3D shapes, chopping parts out of them, and gluing them in place on this shape that you're constructing incrementally. Right? And uh, the way that they handled this, this business of searching for appropriate parts was to first draw some sort of crude 3D proxy, like a, a configuration of bounding boxes. In this case, you see it. Um, if you can see my mouse pointer as uh, blue and yellow bounding boxes on the model on the top. 
And that is used to retrieve a part that sort of looks similar from the purple model. And then there's a pipeline in order to cut it out and stitch it in place, et cetera, et cetera, until you end up with the gray final model uh, on the right. right? So, so it's, it's adding arms to a model that didn't have, uh, to, to a statue that didn't have arms. Okay, so in this case, the search is with this simple crude 3D proxy that's relatively easy to sketch. Uh, some work we did uh, much, much later in 2016 uh, suggests that another way to search for proxies uh, is to sketch it. Right? So in this case, you don't even need a partial shape. You can just sketch a silhouette. And we have this machinery that uh, trawls the database, looks for uh, parts of shapes and, and remember, these shapes need not be pre-segmented, but it, it does this, uh, let's call it uh, virtual segmentation in real time. Uh, and, and it pulls out these parts that satisfy uh, these silhouettes. And then you can use them in this shape that you're constructing. Right? So, so now we have 2D sketches as uh, queries for part retrieval. Uh, another example is the linguistic search that you saw in that little video earlier. So, so this is just a screenshot of that same interface. And um, somehow in advance, we have built this mapping from adjectival attributes, which are the control parameters of this query, to the geometric features of shape parts in our database. OK, um, I'll, I'll very quickly tell you what's happening in the background. Basically, we are trying to learn a basis transform of the of the geometric feature space that we start with right so so imagine that you have you're trying to search for appropriate animal heads so, so all your animal heads are embedded in some feature space which is constructed uh, from uh, you know class by classical methods uh, and classical descriptors or neural descriptors or whatever it is right now within this high dimensional um, feature space what you want to learn is a new basis and the axes of these bases map out how individual adjectives increase through this database. Right? So as you trace the red curve, for example, you get, according to some consensus understanding, stronger and stronger animals. As you trace the blue curve, you get scarier and scarier animals, and so on. Now, I, I won't uh, go into the details for lack of time. Basically, we are doing something similar to SVM training based on training data that we've gathered from the crowd on uh, you know, which animals are considered stronger or scarier or uh, heavier or uh, more big than others. Right? And, and all of this goes into training for this statistical basis. And this is what is used to rank the parts according to each adjective. And then the interfaces exposes these rankings as you manipulate the sliders back and forth. Right? Okay. Now, that's a set of uh, things that you can do with, um, tr with explicit user input as a query. Another thing that you can do is just to take a partial shape as a query. Um, let me see if I can run this video properly. All right, so you have this little simple shape. We search a database with it. That database leads us to, uh, to the database yields parts that can augment this partial shape, we add those to this partial shape, and then we get a new structure. Right? So at the bottom, you see an example of the sort of suggestions that are thrown up by the system that we developed about a decade ago uh, and presented at SIGGRAPH Asia. So you have this green chair, and then if you search our database with this uh, green chair, the partial matching algorithm that runs behind the scene tells you that all the red parts could be feasibly added to this green chair in order to augment it in creative ways. And, and um, I, I don't have time to go into this now, but it's, it's actually interesting the sorts of parts that it often throws up, which you might not have expected. So there's this element of serendipity in part discovery, which I think is accentuated when you don't explicitly ask for a particular type of part sketched out in 3D or 2D or with an adjective or so on. Right? So, so uh, this, is a, this is more a sort of Dadaist exploration of the, uh, of, the, of the design space that is possible by assembling parts. OK, so uh, here's another example that we came up with a little later. Uh, this uh, tries to suggest uh, 
parts in real time. So the tabs on the left uh, tell you at each stage what parts you might be able to add to your partial assembly, and then you can drag and drop them into the design space on the right, right? So, so after you've added four legs, it said maybe you want to add wings to that. We added wings. Now it says you're missing a tail. Do you want to add a tail? Uh, and you add the tail, you position it, et cetera, et cetera. It's all nicely glued together. So there's some you know, fancy gluing code running in the background. And you finally come up with this little creature that you can design in, let's say, two minutes. And we ran all sorts of experiments to show that these real-time adaptive suggestions do actually help the creative process and do help users achieve uh, realistic outputs uh, very effectively and quickly. Right? Okay, so um, what's different from the previous case is that here we are working with a very carefully instrumented database, but then we are learning a much more sophisticated statistical probabilistic model behind the scenes that allows us to do these suggestions in a much more clever and uh, appropriate way, right? So there's a lot more uh, semantic relevance, uh, a little less ser serendipity perhaps, but uh, a fair amount more purpose in uh, how these suggestions are being uh, generated at each stage. Okay. So uh, I will probably skip over the details a little bit for lack of time. The basic idea is that we start with the segmented and labeled data set. We learn a Bayesian network from it. And then we do inference in this Bayesian network conditioned on the partial assembly that we have at any stage in order to generate the suggestions that will best fit the part, both the categories of the parts that are likely to be missing and the specific parts within those categories which are deemed to be the best fit for the shape that you're constructing. Right. So this is data-driven suggestions round two. Okay, so uh, in fairly recent work in SIGGRAPH Asia 2017, we talked about taking this one step further and working with a data set where the parts are not labeled. So we have a neural network and this neural network uh, does uh, part retrieval by taking a partial assembly as input that's on the left. This retrieval network maps that partial assembly to a distribution over the unlabeled parts in our collection. And as you can see uh, in this little schematic, the distribution peaks at parts that it thinks that are, are, are good fits for this partial assembly. And then there's a separate placement network, which I won't really talk about too much in the context of retrieval, which uh, puts that part in the appropriate place. So you can generate construction sequences like you see on the left. Each row is a construction sequence. You start with this, the, the part on the left, and then the network iteratively suggests uh, a, a single part to be added, and you do that over and over again until you have a complete shape. Right? So, so these are completely automatic constructions where each part is suggested by this uh, network running in the background. Okay, so we've seen examples of retrieval driven by uh, uh, by by um, user input and retrieval driven by the current partial shape that you are. Uh, that you have in front of you at any stage without additional input. So the system is trying to hallucinate what you might want to do next. Let's talk about the second axis of the trio of challenges in assembly-based modeling, and that's the actual task of assembling a set of parts once you have them. Now, I like to think of it again in terms of two fundamental questions. One is where are the parts placed? And second, how are the parts glued? together to form a seamless overall assembly. And again, there's a, there's a bunch of classical work on this. And, and, and you know, classical is a very uh, controversial word to use here because all of these papers are from the last two decades. It is not what you would normally think of as classical, but you know, we, are, we are living in this uh, deep learning world where everything that happened before uh, 2012 is, is classical. So um, forgive me for the use of this word. Okay, so one of the approaches that has been uh, that that have that has been explored in some detail for placing parts is to put different shapes in correspondence with each other, either at the point or the part level, and then swap parts between them. So if you know that the legs of two very different animals correspond, you can swap out the legs of one and replace it with the legs of the other, and the position of the original legs tells you where the new legs should go. So, so you can apply that in multiple ways. There are so interesting papers written on, the, uh, on this problem. Uh, these two illustrations come from uh, two different papers and there's, there's more on that topic. Similarly, there is a bunch of work done on gluing parts together uh, using a variety of methods. And, and typically the traditional gluing methods rely on some form of intersurface mapping. You put two uh, parts 
close to each other, you build a map between the overlapping or proximal surfaces, and then you iteratively or in one step solve an optimization problem which tries to deform those, those uh, local regions in order to achieve a smooth join between the parts. Right? Okay, so uh, there are many, many limitations in the traditional modes of gluing parts together. Typically, they require clean cuts, uh, manifold geometry, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And, and secondly, there is a synergy between the placement of parts and the gluing of parts. They go hand in hand, right? You place them in order to be able to glue them well. You glue them if uh, in a way that uh, encourages good placement. So, so there's, there's a synergy between those two things. So um, something that we developed very recently and we presented at uh, 3DB as an oral paper last year is a unified solution for placement and gluing. We, we call this coalesce. It's a funny acronym which basically expands to something describing the process of gluing things together. Um, and, and this is roughly what it does. Coalesce takes a set of 3D parts which have labels but no initial placement. They could be lying on the ground for all we care. And then going from top to bottom here, we train a model to align these parts and then blend them together by synthesizing new geometry in the joint regions. Okay? So this is one pipeline that simultaneously first aligns the parts in a meaningful way and then synthesizes appropriate new geometry at the joint regions to glue together parts that have fairly different interface topologies. Okay, so let's, let's look at how this happens in a little more detail. Um, here's a schematic of our full pipeline. I certainly don't have time to go into this in uh, excruciating detail, but uh, roughly speaking, what happens the left side of this pipeline is part alignment and what happens on the right side of this pipeline is synthesizing those joint geometries. Okay? And uh, I, I'm, let, let's zoom in on that synthesis part a little bit. So what we have here is a cup whose bowl comes from one source shape and a handle which comes from a completely different source shape. Right? So the handle is on the left and the cup uh, bowl is on the right. And our neural network generates this bit in the middle, which is uh, a, a joint uh, surface which can glue these two things together. So imagine taking a blob of super glue and shaping it into the exact correct uh, geometry needed to glue these two things together. Right? So, so on one side, it's trying to fill the two holes in the bowl, and the other side is trying to connect to the two holes in the handle. And uh, we do fossil blending between these uh, three different shapes that we have here, and we finally get the blended result. And, and of course, the magic, so to speak, happens in this middle bit that is synthesized by the neural network to perfectly fit both of these two things that you are trying to glue together. If you just ran you know, default classical Poisson blending between the handle and the uh, bowl with the two joint holes crudely cut out, you'd get something like this, which uh, has all sorts of artifacts at those interface regions. Right? So, so, uh, the joint synthesized by the neural network generates a seamless assembly, which is much better than what you could do with um, the default mathematical optimization. And the reason it can do better, of course, is because it's been trained with a data-driven prior. And we've had access to lots and lots and lots of complete shapes. We've been able to study their joints by, by we, I mean, our neural network has been able to study those joints and focus all its capacity on the synthesis of the geometry of those joints and produce something that looks nice and seamless. Okay, the final axis of our trio of challenges in assembly-based modeling is overall feasibility. In other words, is our assembly fulfilling some sort of design goal or objective or visual plausibility or function or aesthetics and, and so on and so forth. Right? And, and the bulk of work that's happened in assembly-based modeling so far has focused mostly on plausibility and uh, let's call it visual plausibility. In other words, it's fine for putting in a video game, but it's probably not so great if you actually try to fabricate it and use it in the real world. Right? So, so let me give you a little bit of a taste of this in the context of some work that we've done. Um, 
I, I like to think of feasibility as defining some sort of a probability distribution over all possible components, all possible combinations of parts that you could construct from a database of parts. Uh, this distribution can be expressed uh, in, in many, many different ways, either implicitly in a neural network or somewhat more explicitly in, some, in, in a probabilistic graphical model. Uh, this, for example, is a Bayesian network whose which expresses a joint probability distribu distribution whose you know, long and complicated uh, algebraic expansion is written at the bottom. Um, again, we don't have much time to go into what this means, but let me show you what this does in practice. So we take a set of segmented shapes like um, these chairs, they are segmented, though you can't see the segmentation here. And then we train a graphical model on this uh, and data, and then we sample from that graphical model, because remember this expresses a joint probability distribution over combinations of parts. And now we can generate an order of magnitude more chairs, which mix and match parts from the original chairs, but are all quite different. So as you know, notice that stylistic priors are more or less being adhered to this. This model discovers um, stylistic clusters in its latent variables that can sample from them. So you know, that, that, that's sort of nice. Here's another example, which I particularly like. We have a set of segmented and labeled animals, and then we can train a graphical model on them and generate an order of magnitude, more animals, which uh, sort of maintain, let's call them species rules without actual knowledge of species, but uh, are all different from the original ones. And so, so this is work we presented at SIGGRAPH in 2012. So again, this is sort of you know, pre-deep learning, uh, classical graphical models generating some quite nice stuff. But you know, real world assembled shapes can be much more complex than uh, straightforward graphical models can usually capture. And, and this is where we sort of you know, bring ourselves into the deep learning world and look at what more complicated, complicated neural models can capture about these graphs of parts placed in proximity to each other, satisfying constraints, um, having relationships between them, and so on and so forth, right? And there are all sorts of graph topologies and uh, attributes that you can uh, ascribe to the edges and vertices of these graphs. And uh, the neural network has to work pretty hard to, uh, to, to learn a distribution which you can sample from, because remember, we are trying to do modeling, we are doing synthesis, um, we are, that you can sample from over a space of such graphs, right? So each point in the space is a graph. The network needs to be able to synthesize graphs. And we can't assume that these graphs have a fixed topology, right? So, so this, this adds a, a new level of challenge to this problem. So uh, one thing that has kept uh, me and my collaborators busy for, uh, the last several years is this um, insight that graphs can be hierarchically summarized and you can translate the summarization to a neural model. And what do I mean by hierarchical summarization? So let's, let's go into this. Here's a little graph which has uh, four nodes. I can take the right two nodes and I can collapse them into one, right? So now I have a three node graph. Collapse the left two, I have a two node graph. Collapse those two and I have a single noded graph. Now, if I invert this sequence, I go from one to two to three to four, I essentially end up with a tree. Now this tree misses the cycles in the graph and that's not really a problem for some technical reasons, which I omit. But, but basically we've captured most of the interesting stuff that is happening in this graph in terms of this little tree. Okay, so this process of sequential edge collapse and then blowing the whole thing back up again into a tree can be modeled with what's called a recursive neural network. And not a recurrent network which models a chain, but a recursive network which models a tree. And these recursive networks can encode and decode trees of parts. And you can mix and match them to create all sorts of complicated architectures like uh, variational autoencoders, GANs. You can have VAE GANs as, as we did in a paper in SIGGRAPH 2017, which combines a variational autoencoder with, um, an, adversa with an adversarial uh, plausibility score uh, to, to, to form a part, uh, an assembly-based uh, synthesis uh, framework. Okay, so we've applied this idea of recursive nets to all sorts of different problems in assembly-based modeling, shape interpolation and synthesis, scene synthesis, shape composition, evolving shape collections, scan reconstruction, and so on and so forth. Uh, the shape interpolation work uh, has a star because uh, 
in that particular work, we didn't strictly do assembly because we generated the parts in uh, real time as well. So we weren't repurposing found parts, but it's a small tweak to the basic algorithm. You could repurpose found parts if you wanted to. And in fact, the shape composition work on the bottom left uh, does exactly that. It takes a heterogeneous collection of parts from different source shapes and learns how to blend it together into a seamless whole and synthesizes, addition, synthesizes by retrieval additional parts that may need to be added to complete that shape. For example, uh, the, the seat of this tricycle, which was missing in the two source shapes on the left. Okay, so uh, this work has been built upon by others in recent years. One of the papers I'm particularly uh, impressed by is a paper called Structure Net, which took um, our um, recursive net architecture and extended it with uh, general NRE mergers where each merge is done by a little graph neural network uh, on its own. Our original model could only handle binary mergers and some very, very specific types of uh, NRE mergers which correspond to symmetry groups. So you know, there's all sorts of interesting work happening out there on extending this basic hierarchical framework, which sort of maps to our uh, cognitive model for how shapes are assembled from parts. Okay, so looking ahead, let me uh, wrap this up with a note on what I think are interesting things to look at in the future in the light of what we've learned over the last uh, decade and more. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of problems that present themselves. I'm going to focus on three main ones that I think are particularly interesting. One is to incorporate stronger structural and programmatic constraints into um, statistical uh, st into statistical synthesis of assembled shapes. Right? So uh, these, these neural models or graph neural networks, recursive neural networks and, uh, and so on, don't really have very strong notions of how parts fit together. So being able to enforce that more strictly would make these uh, models much more useful for actual applications. Um, the second is to go beyond static parts. In other words, parts that are retrieved from a database uh, by, by, you know, they're cut out of existing shapes or they are hand modeled and, and kept as they are. Uh, these parts are essentially static in all the examples you've seen so far. They are uh, glued into your new shape, but they might as well be made out of steel or wood. You can't do anything additional with them. But you know, this is virtual modeling. We are parts can be param uh, parametrized. They can be parametric parts where you manipulate some uh, control parameters in order to change what the part looks like. Uh, they can be synthesized from scratch using a variety of uh, cutting edge generative models. So what can you do when you assemble the outputs of these um, parametric models or, or other generative models for um, generating the parts themselves? And we have some recent work at CVPR that takes a first stab at jointly retrieving uh, from uh, jointly retrieving and deforming parts in order to create uh, plausible assemblies that fit uh, you know, that, that, that fit uh, image targets, for example. Uh, this is constrained by the fact that you can't actually mix and match parts from different shapes. You're just treating each uh, shape as a parametric assembly, but it's a first step, right? So, so that's something that we've been working on. And finally, you know, I, I bring this up all the time. It would be interesting to uh, have much more a uh, higher level real world functional objectives driving the whole design process and driving the process of synthesis. There have been some interesting works on uh, driving shape synthesis with uh, functional goals and functional priors. Uh, I believe there's a lot, lot more to do in this direction. And I think we'll see some of that happening over the coming uh, years. All right, so I'll wrap up here. Um, you know, there, there are lots and lots of people to thank, so I'll, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll thank them all as a collective. This work is built, uh, a lot of it is built upon the hard work of many student authors. I'd like to especially recognize them and uh, I'll be happy to uh, take questions along with the one. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for the, for the great talks. So we will now start a joint Q&A for both speakers and there are already so many questions. So, and if, if there's a, some questions that left afterwards and please feel free to use our Discord channel for the offline discussion. So let's just uh, give Sid a, a brief break. So start with a question for Tawaki. So Tawaki, so the first question for you is that uh, could this sparse structure be used for occupancy or NERF instead of SDF? Uh, yeah, I believe so. There's also a concurrent work that's really interesting called Neural Sparse Voxel Fields that you should definitely check out if you're curious about the use of arc trees in, uh, for like a NERF. I, I guess like another thing is that I think it would definitely be interesting to use our specific architecture for like this nerve kind of task and see how the performance uh, 
、uh, holds. Thank you for this question.、Uh, thank you for the answer. So the next question is for Sid. So it is possible to extend this type of like assembly-based modeling to large scale. For example, like assembling a virtual city with roads or trees or buildings, because I believe this could be useful for, for example, training a self-driving car in this virtual environment. That's a great question.、Uh, I, I think this is a problem that we wrestle with on a regular basis.、Uh, how do you scale up these models to these、uh, to these huge?、Uh, These huge spaces.、Um, I, I think there are two parts to this. One,、uh, we should qualify this to, to, to say how do we scale up these learned statistical models to these huge spaces.、Okay? So,、uh, scaling either a graphical model or a neural network to automatically learn the rules that generate such large constructions is. Pretty hard. It's an open problem, right? I mean, I don't think we've come anywhere near solving that. On the other hand, if you're prepared to write the rules for the、uh, the, the deterministic or stochastic assembly by hand, there have been works that have looked at specific problems in urban modeling or building modeling,、uh, where you know you write by hand procedures, grammars, or whatever it is, in order to generate these large spaces. And, and you know, people are doing this all the time. You know, video games do it to. Uh, generate very very large worlds procedurally, so it's possible. But、uh, right now, our、uh, best methods,、uh, I, I think, are more handwritten than learned. And I think the challenge is to, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an open challenge to extend the learned models to those spaces. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I do want to sorry, sorry Derek. I, I do want to add that it's not just、uh, the geographical scale、uh, yeah. that is hard to address. Even assembling a car from its actual constituent parts is also tremendously hard because a car has hundreds of thousands of parts that are put together. So even in a small space, assembling something that complicated and learning to assemble it, especially, is is like a super hard problem. So potentially, the challenge lies in like the complexity of the like the graph. For example, if you want to learn like How you want to assemble things, and the rules and those graphs will be like the complexity of the graph will be the major challenge to learn instead of like the scale of the shape you you create. Indeed, it's it's the complexity of the graph and the fact that the points in that、uh, in in instanti instantiations of that graph that actually makes sense are a very 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 small subset of all possible graphs, right? So, so the、uh, more complex your space of graphs is. The smaller the needle you are looking for in this ginormous haystack, and and you know that search problem rapidly becomes harder and harder and harder. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for this great answer. Yeah. So ne next question is for Tawaki.、Um, is it、uh, in your like new LD representation?、Uh, is finding intersection of models like using like various hierarchy? Would that、um, how does that compare to previous approach? But basically. Uh, this neural D has any like benefits? For example, speed up, for example, collision detection or determining intersections. Yeah, so I think there's two parts to that. For the intersection part, I'm not, I'm not sure if the question means like constructed solid geometry trees, for example. But I don't think we necessarily provide any benefits on that end. But I do think that so if you have like a big constructed solid geometry tree, which you might you know make in like a modeling tool or something like that. You actually might end up with like a really big tree of like constructed solid geometry components that might be like hard to transfer over to somewhere else, or might be computationally expensive. So in these cases, if you fit a neural LOD on top of it, then you might actually end up with something that runs faster and is also more compact. So I think there's、uh, reasons to believe that、uh, there would be advantages there. And for like collision detection and something like that, I think it's the same argument holds. If you're working with something really simple like a sphere, I don't think there might not be very big benefits. But if you're working with like a really complex solid、uh, constructed solid geometry tree, then I think you could have benefits from using something like you no know, LOD. I see. So basically, you can we can think of it as a way to compress the entire CSG tree to like a compact representation, and we can potentially do other like all sorts of stuff we want to do with CSG trees like more efficiently. Yeah, exactly. It's like a tree flattening method, basically. Okay, that that's great. Okay, and because of our time, we only have last question for Sid. So in your colleague's work. Uh, can we control the generated join、uh, between components via some parameters or some error metric? Basically,、uh, it's possible to control like how we want to blend、uh, different components. In the in the coalesce paper, right? Yeah.、Uh, no, not not really. I mean, it's it's mostly fully. It's mostly a fully automatic pipeline at this stage. I mean, of course, there are hyperparameters you could tune that 
change what the output is. But uh, we, I mean, it, it would be interesting, for example, to have some sort of uh, additional conditioning that lets you generate a different style of joint, for example. Uh, making that coherent with the rest of the shape would be, I mean, perhaps that should be just best left to the user. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, our method doesn't do that. It's, it, it would be interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you for the answer. So, so we still have a lot of questions, but because we are already over time, so please use our Discord channel for the offline discussion. So now let's thank our speakers again. And, and thank you everyone uh, for joining this colloquium. And let's also uh, thank the artist, uh, Paige Spatatory, for making the poster for this week. And see you all.